Relocating to another country comes with tons of surprises you did not know exist. To them going to fill you in on a lot of the things that you should know before relocating to another country. We're going to answer a series of questions to determine your eligibility for moving abroad. I'm going to undress a lot of the hidden elements that so many relocation experts rarely discuss. What is the cost of living and how does the cost of living in the new country compare to the cost of living in your current country? This is super important for a number of reasons before relocating to another country, whether you want to get residency or whether you want to be a perpetual tourist, it doesn't really matter. You absolutely have to know the cost of living in that new country and whether or not your current monthly income, whether that's a pension, social security, passive income, employment income, whatever you may do, like day trading, if you're investing in credit, though you have to know whether your current income will suffice, whether your current income will provide enough to support yourself in the new country. There are a number of ways for you to figure out what the cost of living is in that new country. One of the best ways to determine the cost is by talking to people locally, of course. When you go there and you start the conversation, right? You just ask them. That's usually one of the best ways. If you talk to experienced expats in that new country, they will tell you, hey, you know what? A liter of gasoline is so much at this place, but if you go to that place, it will be maybe five to 10% cheaper. Or if you wanna maybe go to local markets to buy fresh produce, right? People who've lived in the city or in the town where you're looking to live in will have the answers to your questions. They've been around the block. Another thing that you can do is you can look at cost of living indexes online. There's something important to consider here. Cost of living indexes online are very often manipulated, meaning that the actual cost of living may be higher or lower than demonstrated in the online data, the statistic, whatever you want to call it. I have seen things like this all over the internet because I've been to certain places and some statistics, some data suggested a much higher cost of living or a much lower cost of living than I personally experienced. Why did that happen? Well, let me give an example. It happened because a lot of the times people stay at unrealistic long-term accommodations, like they would stay at hotels or they stay at Airbnbs that are typically at least 60% more expensive than if you were to rent an apartment for the long term. And oftentimes it's actually 80 to 100%, right? You pay a big markup, right? Because you have utilities included, electricity, water, gas, internet, all these things, you know, like maintenance, security, you have all of this included. Whereas if you were to rent an apartment yourself for the long term, you would have to pay for these things yourself. And of course, when someone rents out an apartment, you know, short term, they want to make money because they may have a manager. It takes a lot more management. Maybe they send over cleaning stuff to help you out. So there are all kinds of variables involved here and all kinds of reasons why renting short term is just much more expensive than renting uh, long term, right? Renting short term is more expensive than renting long term. It's a matter of fact. I can definitely attest to the statement I made. I had seen huge discrepancies surrounding cost of living indexes online where I looked up the cost of living index, say in Veracruz, Mexico. When I actually got there, it turned out that the cost of living was lower than what was proposed on the internet. It's just one example that happened to me in real life. Now, sometimes they're actually quite accurate. It depends on who enters the data, you know, what kind of people enter the data and uh, what's the demographic of these people, you know, how much money do they make? And of course, all of this impacts the cost of living index. The people who stay in emerging countries, you know, they're always going to spend more money than the locals who just have way lower purchasing power. I think that goes without saying makes perfect sense. You want to take whatever your current monthly income is and have a look at the cost of living index and just to get an idea. But like I said, sometimes it's not accurate. Another thing you can do is you can talk to people on the internet. You can join, you know, certain groups. You can discuss it with people on YouTube. That's of course great. And of course, you know, if you've worked with us in certain countries, then we can give you first 
hand experience in the places where we operate and we can tell you, hey, maybe this data is completely off or actually this is quite accurate, right? We will be able to tell you why we have staff who lives in the countries that we are backing, that we are promoting. And I personally live in some of these countries myself. So if you come to me, I will give you my first hand experience. Healthcare is another very important topic. Is healthcare affordable, right? How much does healthcare cost? And we're gonna to get to another very important question here in a bit, but you wanna really consider all these moving parts. It all leads back to the same question. Will your current savings or income suffice in your new country? Make sure you answer this question before you relocate. What are the visa and residency requirements? This is a super important question that you heard us cover on this very channel, not just once, but tons of times. Relocating to another country is definitely associated with getting a long-term visa, a residence permit, an indefinite stay allowance. There's some countries that offer this, believe it or not, and we've covered one of these countries in past videos. So there are a lot of reasons why, you know, you would wanna ask this question. As we had seen during the past health crisis, having a long-term reliable visa, like a residence permit, has proven to be worth its money in gold. Because during an emergency situation where you may not be able to travel back home due to restrictions, mandates, it is very important to have a safe place to fall back on. Because in an emergency situation, you never know how authorities react around the globe. So having the security, like having this long-term visa or having this residence permit that allows you to remain in the country potentially indefinitely, assuming you don't break any laws, is worth a lot of money. Some people argue that you should have multiple residence permits to protect yourself. I don't think this holds true for average people and I'm gonna tell you why. A lot of the times, all they really need is just to settle down in one place, get residency, own land, they wanna own companies, they wanna have employment, they wanna settle down with their family, or whatever it may entail, they just wanna be in one country. But to be fair, there are people who wanna pivot. There are people who pivot a lot. They wanna live in multiple countries, and this kind of lifestyle takes a lot more money, takes a lot more maintenance, especially, especially if you of working towards citizenship where citizenship by investment is not an option because you usually start with temporary residency and then you slowly migrate to permanent residency and then slowly after time you migrate to citizenship assuming that you meet all citizenship requirements set by the constitution of the country where you want to become a citizen so this is really important there's nothing wrong with being a perpetual tourist. We've all done it in places like Southeast Asia, Latin America, Eastern Europe, Africa. Many of us actually have followed this path with the simple explanation that, you know, I don't wanna get a residence permit. I don't wanna have all these commitments to the country. This is usually true until people realize at some point they will stop traveling. They will stop like moving so much. And until this realization has happened, people will continue their, you know, laid back lifestyle and their relaxed lifestyle that may not require a lot of commitment because getting residency is, is a process. Sometimes it's a very tedious process. It requires time, money, and energy. And of course, there are requirements that you have to meet, sometimes financial requirements, like minimum income requirements, minimum stay requirements. There are a ton of other things that you may have to meet in order to become a resident of a country. Three, what is the healthcare system like in the country? Now, if you're a young buck and you're watching this video, you're probably scratching your head and asking yourself, why is this guy talking about healthcare? Here. I'm perfectly healthy. I have zero health conditions, no preconditions. I have nothing going on that could potentially expose me in that country. I get it. Still, you should get healthcare. You know, even if it's just like travel insurance, get something. You don't want to end up in a situation where you get into a very unfortunate, very unlikely accident that runs up a huge hospital bill, or even worse, they may not even treat you because you have no insurance. And when they flip you over, you know, on the side of the road and you don't have a credit card in your pocket and no insurance and nobody to call, that is not a good scenario to be in. You want to avoid this scenario from playing out, right? So have health insurance. I think that's very important and the older you become the more important health insurance is you will need it more and health insurance premiums go up 
as you get older. It's a matter of fact. When you're young, they know a lot of the times you won't need much. Unless you get unlucky or you just have a very unfortunate genetic condition, okay, you may need a lot of health care, right? But I'm just saying it's very important. And to those of you watching this video, let's say you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, you know, not in your late teens, not in your 20s anymore, you wanna get health insurance and you wanna figure this out. Now, what we do at Nomad Elite, for our clients, we research healthcare plans and we match our clients with their required criteria so that when they come to the country, they know exactly what to do, where to go, how to sign up, and we assist our clients with this so important process. Never neglect your health because once you lose your health, you lose everything. Your health is everything. You can have all the money in the world. If you don't have health, it isn't worth so much. Other specific vaccinations or health checks that you have to undergo prior to traveling or moving to your new country. There are certain countries that require a set of vaccines before you can immigrate to their countries. It's a matter of fact. If you want to immigrate to the United States of America, you also have to get certain vaccines. If you want to immigrate to certain countries or, or just visit certain countries in Africa, you have to get vaccines. A lot of people don't know this, but it's true. If you want to go to certain countries in South America, you may need to get vaccines. It's very important that you inform yourself about the entry requirements of the country where you're located. Let's say you want to go to Bolivia, you may have to get a yellow fever vaccine. You know, you have to get certain vaccines to be protected against very common infections or viruses that are present in that country. And this is important to follow. And a lot of people don't take this seriously. And because they look back at the past health crisis and they now have an inherent distrust in everything related to medicine, healthcare. I'm not a believer in that. I'm more in the center here. I do believe that certain things during the past health crisis were exaggerated and certain things were not properly or not long enough tested. I think that's true. They just rushed it because they had to come up with something. So I do agree with that, but to not trust improving vaccines is crazy because a lot of us wouldn't even be alive had we not gotten the necessary vaccines from a very early age on. A lot of people tend to forget this, but it's true. Not all vaccines are bad. It's just a matter of fact. Four, what is the job market like? This is super important to all those looking to work in the new country. Let's say you want to become an English teacher. Where do you go? How much do you get paid working for a local school? These questions are so important because, again, you want to see whether you can support yourself in the new country with the new salary you will be offered and paid because you may not have your old salary in the new country. Let's say you move from the United States to an emerging country in Asia, potentially in South America or in Eastern Europe, your salary will be significantly lower, which may not be a bad thing because the cost of living will be lower too. So your earning potential is of course important, but it's also important to, you know, have a look at how it correlates to the cost of living in the country. You can have a high income, right? But if you live in the most expensive places in the entire world, let's say you live in Dubai, you live in Switzerland, you live in Southern California, Hawaii, you know, there's so many expensive places. So even if you have an income of say 100, 150,000, that may not be a lot of money depending on the lifestyle that you are accustomed to. Do you need to learn the local language to find work? This is again under the same umbrella, has to do with work. It is super important for you to find a job that matches your skills, right? You want to match your skills with the right profession. If you want to become an English teacher in a certain country, it's really important to have a look at how much demand and how much supply there is. Supply and demand is everything for work. And guess what? If there's no demand, then it's going to be hard to find a job. Or if there is demand, but there's too much supply, you may end up being underpaid. It's just a matter of fact. And you also want to then see whether you can get a work visa to legally work in the country. That's also important because you don't want to get booted. Do you need to learn the local language to find work? Another very important question. Sometimes people, you know, whatever they want to do, if they want to work in construction or say they work as a manager, as a director, do you need to learn the local language to get a job? I mean, there's so many jobs. You want to ask this question and if the answer is yes, are you willing to put in the time prior to moving to the new country or while you are establishing yourself in the new country? These are all super important questions that you should not forget to ask before moving to your new country. Five, what are the tax implications like? 
super important question that I don't see other fellow YouTubers talk about this much. It is super important to be aware of the tax situation for a number of reasons. You don't want to end up in a situation where you face double taxation because your new country of residency does not have a double tax treaty with your country of citizenship or with your old country of residency. Um, some countries apply residency based taxation. Actually, a lot of them, a lot of them do in Europe in South America, in North America, in Asia, in Africa, right? There are countries that apply residency-based taxation, which means that if you become a legal resident of the country and you comply to all the minimum state requirements and you are gonna have to pay taxes to that country. And oftentimes you have to pay taxes on your worldwide income. You know, some consultants say, yeah, some countries are like the Wild West, you don't have to pay taxes. And they will even mention this during their consultations. I have clients who come to me who've consulted with other people that have made such statements. While this may be true, it does not eliminate any tax obligations that you may have to the Wild West country. It is just how it is. If there is a double tax treaty in place, it gets a bit easier because a lot of the income will not be taxed twice. So this is good. Generally speaking, locally generated income will be taxed in the country where it's been generated. There are tons of exceptions here, but I'm just saying if you have a rental property in a country, it generates you monthly income. You typically pay that income to the local government. Let's say that's in Spain. Let's say that's maybe in Italy. You would have to pay that rental income tax, right? I mean, that income tax to the government. This is very common. There are some countries that have territorial tax systems where foreign source income is typically excluded from your tax burden. Even if you're a resident of that country, they're going to exclude that because it's a territorial tax system where they just don't request that a lot of the times. And especially if it's like something like a rental property or if, if you have some business in another country, right? Of course, then you have to pay the corporate taxes to the government of the country wherever the company is incorporated in. I mean, there are so many things here to consider. The United States embraces residency-based taxation and citizenship-based taxation on your worldwide income. So any income that's generated, you know, be it from a an income abroad, um, you may have to pay taxes on that income in the United States as a United States citizen. Citizenship based taxation is one of the wildest ways for governments to pretty much take a bite out of everything that you make, no matter where you make it. It's pretty brutal. A lot of people don't understand it. Many people think it's unfair. And I definitely have to agree with this statement, especially if you are an expatriate living in a foreign country and you haven't spent a single day, you know, during a calendar year in the United States, yet you're required to pay taxes on income that you generate abroad. I mean, it's very, very strange that they came up with this system, but they need more money and not less money to fund their debt. Six, what is the language barrier? We touched on this very briefly when we talked about work. The language barrier is very important. And this is not just associated with your job, your business. Language barrier is very important for forming meaningful connections in the new country. If you want to enter a relationship, a long lasting relationship, what are the requirements? What are the language norms in the country? You know, what language is spoken in the country? There are countries where you can get by with just English. There are other countries where Spanish is a necessity or say, Russian is a necessity. And it's not just related to the country, but more so to the geographic location where you decide to settle down in. There may be certain metropolitan areas in the country where you're looking to relocate to where the local language may not be as required as in the rural areas. The rural areas are just more filled with people that are not moving around as much. The metropolitan areas, they typically have a high turnover of people. And because of that, you know, you find people from all kinds of different places. Do you need to learn the local language to live comfortably in the new country? Let's say you want to relocate to a South American country. Let's say that's Bolivia or Paraguay, it is very likely that you need to learn the local language to live life. Unless you want to live in some of the more fancier neighborhoods in these places, you know, in the capital cities. And even then, you know, a lot of people don't speak English. That's just one example. Let's say you want to move to, I don't know, maybe Portugal. Now, Portugal is again good because in Lisbon, a lot of people speak English. Let's say you want to go to maybe, 
I don't know, some smaller city in Vietnam, let's say near Trang or Da Nang, where English is not so widely spoken. In Ho Chi Minh City, you will find more people that speak English. On a percentile basis, there will be more people that speak English in Ho Chi Minh City than in Da Nang, because it's just more international, even though Da Nang has changed a lot over the past 10 to 15 years. There are certain things you can do to bypass the language dilemma. And one of the things you can do is to hire an assistant. Or you can also leverage off of a local person, be it a friend, a significant other, a relative, or someone. As long as you have some sort of connection with someone who is fluent in the local language, you may be able to bypass the language barrier. But like I said, a lot of places, they do require you to learn the local language and of course also adapt to the cultural norms. Which leads us to point number seven, what are the cultural norms like? You want to ask yourself, how are foreigners perceived in the country you're looking to relocate to? Are foreigners welcome? Are foreigners unwelcome? What are the requirements for you to integrate into society in the country? A lot of people tend to ignore this fact and they only live within the expat bubble, meaning they only associate with other expats, which is totally fine. And I think that's what a lot of people should do for a number of reasons. You always seek like-minded people and Secondly, the language is the same, perhaps the culture is more similar. There are good reasons for you to remain in your expat bubble. However, at some point you want to leave the bubble and experience life in different places and with different people. And oftentimes you can only do that when you put in the hard work necessary that unfortunately very few people are willing to put in because it takes a lot of personal sacrifice, a lot of cultural change. You have to blend in. And what does it take to blend in? You have to learn about the local language, local mannerism, which is very different to the mannerism that you're accustomed to in your home country. For instance, I was born in Austria and sometimes when I'm hanging out in Texas, some people notice that because of my mannerism, I cannot be from Texas. For instance, when I talk to someone, like sometimes in the US, people are standing very far apart and they still manage to have a conversation because they speak at a much, you know, higher volume. When I talk to someone, I typically get very close to them and then I start the conversation. And based on my European mannerism, people see that I cannot possibly be from the United States of America. Even though my accent may be thin to non-existent, Existing. In fact, very few people pick up on this mannerism because it takes a lot of observation to notice these very slight cultural differences like mannerism. But the people who pick it up, they are usually, you know, far ahead of everybody else. There will be lots of cultural differences, such as how people communicate. How do they speak? You know, do they use their body language a lot? Are they communicating with their hands? What is their facial expression like, right? There's so much to learn about a new culture that it will take years, sometimes even decades to learn it all. 